So welcome back. Let's continue on with our stories early in the semester here. And we had just finished just a quick little review before we get on to our next topic, pre-civilization, right? And we had talked about the characteristics of pre-civilization, the Neolithic period, uh, first of all, the Paleolithic, then the Neolithic period, the Neolithic revolution, gave you a couple of things to work on in terms of studying, short answer type questions, fill in the blank questions, the IDs, that'll be part of the midterms. Uh, and so forth. So you have some things to already start thinking about in terms of how to study and how to prepare. So, you know, obviously all those characteristics of a Paleolithic period you should know, and you should be able to know this information again without having to look at your notes very much. Yes, the exams are open notes. Yes, the exams are open notes, open books, and all of that, but there's going to be so much information that it's going to be really hard to find it all, you know, in the time that you're limited on taking a test or a quiz. So know it really well, and just kind of have that as a crutch if you need it. I hope that makes sense. You'll do a lot better in the course that way. So anyway, so know all that, and now we need to move on to the beginning of civilization. And so there are a couple things we're going to get out of this lecture. Uh, first of all, what do we mean by civilization? What are the characteristics of civilization that are different than pre-civilization? And then we also want to know where civilization begins. We'll talk about geography again. It's part of that big theme that we're going to be discussing a lot, how geography impacts a lot of these early civilizations. So that's something to pay attention to as well. So let's go to our first set of keywords. And these are the key words, and I'll explain this image here as well, of the characteristics of civilization. There are about five, six major characteristics of civilizations, things that distinguish civilization from pre-civilization. So let's go through them all, and again, you want to know all of them. Uh, the first one there you see is written language. In pre-civilization, you had spoken language. In civilization, you have written language. An example of written language is cuneiform. And so you see the word there. And then you also see the image here of a cuneiform tablet. Uh, this again dates back to about 3000 BC period. Uh, as that's how old this, this first kind of uh, period of civilization begins. So it's around 3000 BC when we start to see these characteristics of civilization. Remember, that's when the Neolithic Revolution ends and civilization begins anywhere around that time period. All right, so cuneiform is an example of writing. So one is written language. Uh, two, and again, if I say there are five or six major characteristics of civilization, good idea in your notes. Obviously, as I talk about each of these things, number them, one, two, three, four, five. If there's anything specific I say about one of them, note that too. Again, I can ask you a quiz question. What is an example of an early form of writing discussed in the lecture? And then you would need to know cuneiform as an answer. Uh, so just kind of another example of a possible quiz question. Second is cities. So one is written language, two cities. So in pre-civilization, remember they were nomadic. In civilization, you have cities. They're staying in one place. These cities aren't massive in size, but you do have cities. That's something you have. Monumental architecture. And what I mean by that is building something big, right? Uh, there's a lot of examples of monumental architecture throughout history, from the Colosseum to the pyramids. Uh, there's one that I'm going to show you a picture of after I'm done with all this called the Ziggurat. Uh, it's this massive example of monumental architecture in what is modern day Iraq in a city called Ur. Uh, so that's kind of where you have that uh, example of monumental architecture. And I'll show you an example of it in a second. But let me just run through these other characteristics. Uh, so one is written language, two cities, three monumental architecture, four metal. Uh, fourth characteristic of civilization is metal and pre-civilization. Remember to use stone, now use metal. What kind of metal? Well, as you see there, it says bronze. Uh, sometimes, in fact, from about 3000 uh, to 1000 BC, we call that the Bronze Age uh, because that was the prominent metal used in the early period of civilizations. So you have that. And then occupational specialization, that is sometimes considered a characteristic of civilization. Occupational specialization, that's, you know, jobs, people doing different jobs. And the last characteristic I want you to know is political organization. And what we mean by political organization, that's laws, governing, rules, you know, all those things. Some people put economics in there. 
So these are easy. These are the big characteristics you need to know. So again, uh, written language is one, cities is two, monu arch monumental architecture is three, use of metal is four, occupational specialization to having different jobs is five, and political organization, that's kind of a catch-all of laws and government and currency even, uh, that would all be part of political organization. So those are the things you have that distinguish civilization from pre-civilization. All right, so I hope all of that is clear and you have all those down and you, you can kind of make sure you know all those characteristics and then give you some specific details on a few of them. All right, let's go on. And this is the ziggurat. Uh, so this is just a big example of the ziggurat at the city of Ur. Again, it's located in modern day Iraq. Uh, so it's just a good example of monumental architecture that a lot of students are not familiar with. Uh, most people have heard of the pyramids and the Colosseum. And so this is one of the earlier examples of monumental architecture. So I always like to use this as an example. All right, so just kind of an image to be familiar with. All right, the next thing, so now we know what the characteristics of civilization are. Now we need to know where does it all begin, where does civilization start, and talk about the geography and the earliest civilizations that we have recorded that we can just talk about a little bit. All right, so here are the key words for a place called Mesopotamia. And I'll show you in a map in a second. So in fact, why don't you go ahead and write all these words down because I'm going to do most of this explanation while you're on a map image because it helps to have a map to understand all this. Uh, so write these words down, Mesopotamia, Fertile Crescent, Tigris, Euphrates, uh, Epic of Gilgamesh, Polytheistic, uh, Sumerian, Akkadian, Second Sumerian period, get the dates. Again, you could just pause it. And again, with dates, guys, you don't need to memorize specific dates, right? Uh, these are all circa dates. It's just to have a rough time period of when these things are happening, but you don't need to get bogged down on all the specific dates. So just kind of keep that in mind. All right, so again, you can always pause if you're not quite done writing all this down, get all these keywords down, and then I'm going to go to a map and explain all these key keywords as we talk about the beginning of civilization in a place called Mesopotamia. All right, here we go. So here's our map, Mesopotamia. Here it's spelled Mesopotami. Um, and so what is Mesopotamia? What does that word mean? Well, if you look at Mesopotamia, it actually is two words, meso, right? If you could break it down here, meso, and potami or potamia, you're going to get different spellings. What does the word meso mean? Well, the word meso means middle. Remember, like Mesolithic, Mesoamerica, um, and so meso means middle. Uh, what is potamia? Well, the word potamia comes from the Greek word potamos. And the word potamos basically, not basically, the word potamos means rivers. So when you say Mesopotamia or Mesopotami or Mesopotamos, right, however you want to say it, it is, means the land in the middle of the rivers, right? Potamia is rivers, Meso is between, the land between the rivers. That's what Mesopotamia means. And the rivers that we're referring to are these two really important rivers called the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. They were those key words. And so why are the rivers important? Why does civilization develop around Mesopotamia? So there are several things you need to know about the impacts of these rivers. And again, it's, this is the geography thing. It's not enough just to know that there are rivers. You need to know what's the impact of these rivers. What are they used for? What are their positives? What are their negatives? What's the deal with these rivers? So other than knowing them, what do we need to know? Well, number one is that these rivers, I'm going to give you several things you need to know. Number one is that the Tigris and Euphrates provide simple things like food, right? Uh, fish. Uh, another thing that the Tigris and Euphrates provide is travel, right? You can move along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers uh, because they're, they're rivers. You can, you know, you can sail and navigate the rivers. Another impact or another effect of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers is transportation, right? So uh, transportation, communication, all of that. Uh, food, not only fish, but water to fertilize the land. In fact, this entire region is referred to as the Fertile Crescent. You can see where it says Fertile Crescent here. Everything in green is the Fertile Crescent because the Tigris and Euphrates fertilizes the land, makes it easier to grow crops. 
Um, the, the water also attracts animals, which you can hunt. So that brings more food supply to people. Uh, obviously water for drinking, mud for building, all of those are things that the Tigris and Euphrates rivers provide the people in Mesopotamia. So it's not enough just to say, well, there are two rivers. You need to know the effects these rivers have, why these rivers are important. So whenever you're thinking about geography, you know, I, I created a, uh, in your, in your week one module, a chart that kind of had that you should print it out. And every time I talk about geography, use it to fill it out, fill it out, and it'll help you keep some of these points straight. Now we're not done with the Tigris and Euphrates because there's something else you need to know about the Tigris and Euphrates, which is very important, and the geography in this whole region of Mesopotamia. So the rivers, right, they, they do what other rivers do as well. The rivers overflow their banks. All rivers flood. The Tigris and Euphrates, however, are not that predictable. You don't know when they're going to flood. You don't know how much they're going to flood. And this is actually a big negative for the people living in Mesopotamia. Because if you don't know how much the water is going to flood, then if it doesn't overflow its banks enough, if the water doesn't go over the banks, well, then you have a, a, a drought. You can't grow your food. Worse, the flood can come really strong and it could destroy everything in the area if there's a big, huge flood. So that, that's a problem, right, that the floods could destroy things. So that's very problematic. The other problem you have with Mesopotamia, while there's some geographical positive things, there's a negative as well. Other than the floods being irrational, the, the river's not flooding in a rational way, it's fertile land. It's fertile land, so everyone's going to want to go there. And what don't you have around Mesopotamia? You don't have a lot of big mountain ranges. You have the kind of the Zagros mountain ranges you could see here. If you don't remember that term, that's okay. But generally, it's relatively open land. So you have a lot of open land with rivers that fertilize the land, but not a lot of protection. What does that mean? You can probably see where this is going. Invasion. And so this land of Mesopotamia, which, by the way, if you haven't figured this out, is modern-day Iraq, right? This is where modern-day Iraq is. Uh, that land is constantly under the threat of invasion. And that's one of the negatives. So if you're living in the area of Mesopotamia, the geography creates problems for you as well. Yes, it benefits you, but also creates problems. And so you're invaded often. You don't have a strong, stable political system there. Therefore, you're always having different threats of different civilizations moving in. That's a problem. Uh, you see it even in their religion. When you look at the gods in Mesopotamia, this is definitely worth noting. The gods in Mesopotamia, they're polytheistic. Polytheistic meaning many gods, right? More than one god as opposed to monotheism. And these polytheistic gods are oftentimes very malevolent in Mesopotamia. And what I mean by malevolent, they're harsh, they're mean, uh, they're not benevolent. And maybe you see such harsh gods because of the harsh environment you're living in. So you see how the geography impacts several things. It, it impacts the lack of political stability. It impacts their religion. It impacts their ability to grow food. And it impacts invasions. It even impacts their literature. There is a story called the Epic of Gilgamesh. And in this Epic of Gilgamesh, there is a lot of passages. And when you listen to the passages that come out of the Epic of Gilgamesh, you see even in their stories, references to how geography destroys things. So I want you to listen to these passages from the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? So this is one passage here from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Okay, so here's one passage. Just kind of listen carefully. This is how it goes. The rampant flood, which no man can oppose, which shakes the heavens and causes the earth to tremble, in an appalling blanket folds mother and child, Beats down the crane brinks full luxury and greenery and drowns the harvest in its time of ripeness. Rising waters, grievous to the eyes of man, all-powerful flood which forces the embankments and mows down mighty trees, frenzied storms tearing all things in mass confusion with their hurling speed. Okay, so that's right out of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And when you listen to those words, it's about destruction. It's about, you know, pain and all of that. And you see how even their literature is impacted by geography. And so that's when I say, you know, understand how geography matters and how it impacts civilizations. 
those are things you'll need to know throughout the first half of this semester. It's one of the big themes we're going to be covering. All right, so that's the Epic of Gilgamesh. So here we're back to our map of Mesopotamia, and we know now several things, right? We know what the characteristics are of civilization. We know about geography in Mesopotamia, how it helped, how it hurt. Um, now we could actually begin to talk about the earliest civilizations in Mesopotamia. And the first civilization there that was already listed for you in those other key terms is the Sumerians, right? So you should have those written down from before. Remember, always write that in the key words because I'm going to refer to them as I'm going along. Um, the Sumerians. And there isn't much you need to know about the Sumerians other than what you kind of already know. So just a few things. So right now, as you're taking notes, you should be writing down the word Sumerian again and just a few little quick bullet points on what you need to know about them. Number one is that they lived in Mesopotamia. Number two is they dated back to about 3000 BC. Number three is that they used the cuneiform writing, right? That they used that cuneiform writing. Number four is that they were not united. Instead, they were divided up here with a whole bunch of independent Sumerian kingdoms. You see some of them on this map, like Ur, Uridu, Uruk, right? Those are just a few examples of Sumerian kingdoms that they weren't united and they weren't bonded. So you had that first Sumerian kingdom, and that's really all you need to know about it. Guys, the early, earliest civilizations, we don't spend a lot of time on in this class because, A, we were, were, first of all, more in the Middle East. When I teach my history in the Middle East class, we spent all semester in this neck of the woods, right? Uh, in a Western civilization class, we're going to move over westward pretty quickly. Uh, and the other reason I don't spend a lot of time on this is we just don't have as much information on these guys as we do the Greeks or the Romans. So other than that, that's all you need to know about the Sumerians. Then we have a new group of people moving into Mesopotamia. And those are what we call the Akkadians. Again, you have their words, the, that, that key word as well there. The Akkadians come in from about, again, 2400 roughly to about 2100. And the only thing you need to know about them is they displace the Sumerians from power for a few hundred years. It seems like the Akkadians are the dominant force instead of the Sumerians. We know that because there seems to be a new language that's in that region. And so then the Sumerians um, are kind of out of influence there. They don't just disappear. The Sumerians are, in fact, still there. And in fact, as we get to closer to about 2100 BC, the Sumerians return. And we get to what we call the Second Sumerian Period. And that Second Sumerian Period that you also had listed there is from about 2100 to 2000 BC. Now, the Second Sumerian Period from about 2100 to 2000 BC is only about 100 years, right? But they actually do some pretty cool things. So I'm going to give you, again, about four things, four or five things here about the Second Sumerian Period. Again, that means jot them down, one, two, three, four, five things in the Second Sumerian Period that I want you to know. Number one. During the Second Sumerian period, they built the ziggurat. So that ziggurat image I showed you before, they built that during the Second Sumerian period. So that's number one. Number two, the Epic of Gilgamesh is written down. So that Epic of Gilgamesh that I had lectured on or recited from, it's written down during that time period. You know, what's the big deal? Well, it's the first example of literature in human history, actually. Not the first example of writing, the first example of literature during in human history. So that's the Epic of Gilgamesh. So that's second. Number three, a third thing they develop is medicine. We have examples of them performing surgeries during the Second Sumerian period. A fourth uh, point I want you to know is mathematics. They develop the concept of there being 360 degrees in a circle. So a circle has 360 degrees. They were the ones who came up with that concept. And another point that we see developing is that they understood astronomy, that they recognized that there were other planets. So all of those are pretty impressive, right? These are all things that they knew. They may have not been the ones, by the way, who came up with 360 degrees in a circle. I honestly don't know who's the first to develop it, but they understood it. 
So they understood math, they understood astronomy, they understood medicine, they understood architecture, literature. Um, and so you'd say, wow, this second Sumerian period is pretty impressive. They're around for all these years, uh, for only about 100 years, but they did a lot, which leads to a very important question. If they were around for 100 years and they did that much, why didn't they last longer? Why didn't they have greater uh, of success as a civilization in terms of staying around longer? And the reason they didn't last as long is what you're going to talk about next lectures. All right, so that's it. That's the dawn of civilization in Mesopotamia. So again, out of this lecture today, you should have known the characteristics of civilization, the geography, and just a little bit about these early people in Mesopotamia, the Sumeria, the Akkadia, and Second Sumerian period. Um, other than that, you should just, again, work on short answer or fill in. Really, they're going to be more fill in the blank style questions. I think pretty much most of the questions are going to be that. On your quizzes, they may be a couple true-false questions, a couple multiple-choice questions, but most of them are going to be simple fill-in-the-blank questions. So again, what is an example of writing that the Sumerians used? Cuneiform. Or I can ask you, cuneiform was used by which civilization? The Sumerians, right? That's the way the first quiz is going to work. So I hope so far everything is clear as you're listening to these first few lectures, right? Again, if you have any questions, anything's unclear, please let me know. You know, I'm more than happy to talk to each individual students. If you need any help, anything's unclear, uh, never be afraid to kind of reach out to me. You have my email. That's the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, and, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions. Other than that, you guys have a good day. Thank you.